church? Is it an encouragement? Is it a healing? Is it a, is it a word to give you a bit of a kick because you need to start changing something? Um, but whatever it is, God has got something for each and every one of us today. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Philippa and I'm our worship leader for today and Russell will be bringing us the word. This service is, um, is a very relaxed service. So if you find that God is speaking to you and um, you want to bring a prayer, you want to bring a word, um, this time to share testimony, do feel free, there will be space to do that this morning. So I'm just going to open in prayer first up. Hey, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this glorious morning that you have given us. We thank you for the freedom that we have to come here to choose, to come and be with the body of Christ and to worship you. Father, we pray that you might send your spirit so that it hovers over us here. Father, that you will speak to us in all ways that we need to hear this morning. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. We're going to start our service with a couple of songs that um, run together, so please stand and join us. Thank you. 
us with the praises of your people. And Father, we want to lift you up. Father, we want to give you all glory and honour, for you alone are the King of Kings. And Father, we declare this morning that you alone are Lord. Father, thank you that you tell us that when we come to you with anything, you hear us. And Father, right now we pray that you'll bring to mind anything that we need to say sorry for this morning. Father, anything that we need to just confess. Father, we know that you are the God who forgives. Father, through your blood on the cross, we all receive forgiveness. Father, thank you for your grace. Amen. Would you like to be seated? At this time in our service, we have um, what we call a testimony time. So it's your chance to share what God's been saying to you lately. It might be something today, it might be something this week, it might be something recently that, hey, today he's prompting you to share with everybody. So the floor is open. Okay, we're going to continue. Um, I've got another song that... Um, yeah, I just really love, and I felt God wanted us to have it this morning. What a beautiful name. It just focuses on who God really is and giving him all the honor this morning. So please stand and join with me. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. You're hidden. Sin was great, your love was greater 
name is the most powerful on earth. Father, may all eyes look to you. For you, Jesus, are our hope. You are our hope in our world today. We give you honour. We give you glory. We lift your name high today. If you have any words of praise, you're welcome to share them. Thank you, Father, that you care about even the little things in our life day by day. Okay, you're welcome to sit. As I uh, mentioned last week, that's a good word right there. That's a good word. Somebody here, uh, God's ministering to you right at this moment. He's invited you here for a purpose, and that is to hear that he's with you even in that swirling and that mess. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look into his face and that issue will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace father god we thank you for your word we thank you lord that even to this day you still continue to speak through your saints and we thank you for that we thank you lord for the invitation to be here this morning to hear your word and uh, we ask, Father, that by your Spirit you will open the ears of our hearts to hear what you may have to say to us here this day. Amen. Uh, as I've begun doing, I'd also like to welcome uh, those who are watching us online uh, and recorded. It's a blessing to have you with us. So we're going to read this morning 
And we're going to have a go with this clicker as well. Let's see how this goes. So Luke 9, 51 to 62, we'll begin with, uh, with 51. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him, who went and entered a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him, because his face was set toward Jerusalem. His face was set towards Jerusalem, and the people in the village, of, uh, in the Samaritan village, would not receive him. And when I was reading that on Monday, I'm thinking, why not? And God quickened my heart to the history of what was between the Jews and the Samaritans in Jesus' time. And he's encouraged me to share a little bit with you this morning on uh, the history between the Samaritans and the Jews. And the reason he quickened that to my heart to do that this morning is I'm sure that most of us here understand when we hear the word Anzac we understand the relationship between New Zealand and Australia that has been around what, 120 years or so uh, we as Kiwis understand what the relationship is between uh, Australia and New Zealand and most times apart from rugby it's a really good relationship right and it's and it is and it's and what was interesting was we had some overseas students and one of our overseas students was from Germany and um, Felix, great guy, still keep in touch with him to this day, a, a wonderful young man. But he didn't understand how two countries can have each other's backs. This was an unusual circumstance for him. And I said, well, so natural, we just get on with our... Aussie mates and, and we get on with it you know and it's the same here with this Jew and the Samaritan thing it's huge in the story but I felt that unless we can come to some kind of understanding on what the issue actually was and it also impacts uh, very much on Jesus um, way that he dealt with uh, you hear him often talks about the scribes and the priests and the leaders of the of the um, of the church and the Pharisees, it leads a lot into that. So we're going to spend just a little bit of time this morning, and I'm going to just do some teaching on the history of uh, what was happening uh, back in the day and how this difficulty between the Samaritans and the Jews happened. Now it all begins with King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. And what happened was that when the exile took place, Nebuchadnezzar took most of the Jewish population to Babylon. That's the exile. We've, we all know the song, don't we? By the rivers of Babylon, right? Except for the elderly and the infirm. He left them behind. Because probably a burden, I don't know. Left them behind. But what he also did was that he left behind many of the temple scribes to look after the elderly and the infirm. So he left those people behind. What happened was that the scribes, now that they are living in a country that's almost empty, they decided that they would shift in to the vineyards and to the olive groves and all the other things that were happening around in that area, which included Samaria. So these areas, uh, a lot of them that we will recognise, areas like Decapolis, we heard about when, when remember when Peter said that um, uh, you are the Christ? That happened over in Decapolis, so that's on that side. Then we've got Samaria, we've got Galilee, and we've got Judea. So that's the map that was around in Jesus' time. What happened was that these scribes who are now, if you like, occupying these regions that are now empty, intermarried with the Samaritans of the time. And so uh, the Samaritans were no longer a pure Jewish race. They had intermarried with uh, not only with the Jewish scribes, but also with uh, other nations that were around them. Then, 70 years later, when the Jews returned... So this is in Nehemiah's time. Remember, they were sent back 
uh, out of exile. They were sent back to um, uh, modern-day Israel to rebuild the temple walls and to um, so rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and the temple. And the Samaritans then came over to offer their help and say, well, we're here to help you build, uh, rebuild Jerusalem. Um, and they were rejected by the Jews because the Puritan Jews uh, called these Samaritans half-breeds because they're no longer the pure uh, race from Father Abraham. They had intermarried with other races that were around them, which was against uh, God's uh, ruling at the time. So the Samaritans didn't quite get the huff, but certainly felt rejected by the Jews who had come back from exile. So they went back to Samaria and they built their own temple. And the Jews considered that temple a pagan temple. And that's when the feud began, as feuds do. And by the time of Christ, the Jews hated the Samaritans so much that they wouldn't take the shortcut to Jerusalem through Samaria, they would actually cross the Jordan and take the long way around through Decapolis to get to Jerusalem because they didn't want to sully their feet on Samarian soil. So let's read on. Here we go. And when his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to tell fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he, Jesus, turned and rebuked them, and they went on to another village. So Jesus would have none of this pettiness. The Samaritans had rejected them uh, spending time uh, in their country, and so uh, here's James and John, uh, one of the top three in the, uh, in the group of the disciples, said, well, do you want us to smite them? Come on, let's call down. For yeah. Jesus would have none of that pettiness. And that's proven out in John 4.4. 4. Because who can tell me where the woman from the well comes from? Samaria. So what was Jesus doing in Samaria? He had a divine appointment with her, absolutely. But what we're starting to see here is that Jesus is cutting through all this rubbish from the history. This pettiness of who's with who and what, Jesus, not only did he, go, did he go effectively into enemy territory, but he met with a woman who was on her own. Read the story for yourself. It is a wonderful, wonderful story on Jesus showing the importance that he held women in. And that's where I personally really struggle with the history of the church where women are being put back into this role that Jesus did away with when he was here. But what's interesting with this woman also is that she was the first one that Jesus said, I am Messiah, to, uh, over and above even any of his uh, disciples. And I find that absolutely profound. But moving through that, later on in Scripture just to shame the Jews even more regarding their prejudice, just to rub salt in the wound, if you like, Jesus made one of the main characters in one of his parables in Luke 10. Remember, there was a man who was left for dead on the side of the road. He'd been beaten up by robbers. Who ignored him? Who ignored him? The priest? And the Levite. So the listeners are going, oh, well, wonder who's going to tend to him. Who tended to the man on the side of the road? Samaritan. I can imagine that the Jewish listeners would be beginning to squirm as to uh, the rights and wrongs, as to actually what is this uh, all about. And you know, today we still have a help organization bearing the name the Good Samaritans. So the impact throughout history by these so-called second-class rate, 
uh, second class uh, race have been lifted up and are seen even today as being people of good character. And it's even part of our vocabulary as we speak of caring people. I'd also like to note that it was the one and only leper in Luke 10. Uh, sorry, the only, one and only leper, uh, it's in Luke 17. The one and only of the 10 that were cured, the one and only that came back to thank Jesus was a Samaritan. Was a Samaritan. It's making the Jewish culture of that day look rather arrogant and bigoted. And it presents the Samaritans mentioned as genuinely humble before the Lord. And so it's in John 4.26 that we find an important revelation. As I mentioned before, it was to an alleged sinful Samaritan woman not a Jewish audience, that Jesus announced that he was the promised Messiah. Jesus was not prejudiced, and he taught his followers to respect all people. Now, coming back to who had begun occupying the land uh, during the time of exile, it was the scribes. They had taken over the vacant land during that time of exile and they became so wealthy and so lazy that they actually hired servants to copy the scrolls. They then sat around and they became the lawyers who interpreted the law of Moses. And as we read in Luke 15, it says, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city, who were the scribes, incited them against Jesus. They concocted and invoked. Not only did they eternally damage the Jewish relationship with God, but fortunately for us, through their actions, they forced open the door for the Gentiles. Remember, God's, Jesus said that I come first to the Jews. And then he was rejected. And that a lot of the uh, insurrection was stirred up by these fat cats who were the leaders of the city at the time. And it was through that, that through Peter meeting with Cornelius, that the door for us Gentiles was thrown wide open. And that we were then able to become adopted children of the Most High God. Amen? Is that good news? That is such good news. So that's the route that Jesus took through Samaria. Let's read on. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to hang his head. I think it's, it's incredible in this part of the reading that... Uh, Um, that it appears that the creator of all is saying that I have nowhere to hang my head. He's, and, and I think that we can be very comfortable in thinking that being a follower of Jesus, that everything in our life is going to be neatly laid out, comfortable or easy. Friends, it's going to be rewarding and there will be eternal abundance. But the irony of this verse is that even Jesus had nowhere to call his own, and yet he owned everything. And so all that we have comes from the Lord, and that we push through on that, uh, acknowledging that Jesus knows what it is uh, to go without. 
Let's read on. To another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Saints, I struggled with this. Let the dead bury their own dead, but these people are alive. They must be. They were talking to Jesus. And I don't know whether this is an original thought or, or what, but uh, I felt very clearly uh, the Lord say to me, you do of course appreciate, Russell, that there are no dead people in heaven. There's no dead people in heaven. Did you know that if you were a follower of Jesus, when you die, you're not dead? Did you know that? Do you know that here this morning? That if you're a follower of Christ, when you die, you're not dead. When a believer dies, they transition, I think would be a better term. When a believer dies, they transition. They transition from one reality to another. So therefore, it's only the dead who can bury the dead. I've read of a non-believer. In fact, he was, he was described in this, in this book as an evangelistic atheist. An evangelistic atheist. Apparently he told everyone that religion, so he, he was a great proponent for atheism, uh, which seems a bit sort of back to front, doesn't it? He told everyone that religion is a crock and God not only does not, but cannot exist. He went on to write that one day um, he was in an operating theatre and he flatlined on the table. He died on the table. Um, and he said that what he experienced was total blackness, darkness. He said nothingness. But here's the thing, folks. He experienced that. I can't get my head around it, but, and I don't want anybody's head to explode here this morning. But he experienced nothingness. Experienced nothingness. He was aware of nothingness. Until a voice whispered in that nothingness. He said, I wanted to love you so much. And this is the consequence of the choices you have made. I want to love you so much, but this is the consequences of the choice that you made. And that then made me start thinking about procrastination. And so just for a moment, talk amongst yourselves and those around you. What is procrastination? And do you and when? And then we'll come back just in a few minutes. Do you and when? I wish I'd put on there and what do you procrastinate about, but I thought, well, although we are family, I probably could have asked that question. Anyone like to share anything? You don't have to. It's just anyone like to share times when they might procrastinate or... Yep, we can do it later. <laughs> nice. Well done. Um, about seeking treatment for something that potentially could be hmm. life-threatening. Yeah, and we and we do that. I think we do that when we don't want to know an outcome. Yep. We're That's afraid. It's good. good. Yep. Yeah. Procrastination out of fear. Blokes are really good at that. 
Oh, I speak for myself. I am. Anyone else? Uh, Daryl? Uh, we talked about the difference between procrastinating and deciding actually not to follow through with something because it's not actually... Uh, we're putting a boundary around that and saying, no, that's not what I'm going to do. And we're, that that's not procrastination, but that's finishing a season and, and being comfortable with Good. saying no. Whereas procrastination is that sense of maybe the shoulds and the oughts that oh, I yeah. should be doing this, but I'm not doing it. So yeah. That's excellent. That's right. Saying I'm not going to do something. Anyone else? Hold on a second, Gwen. Here we go. I think of procrastination in my working life where mm -hmm. there were things that had to be dealt with and because I put them off, you tend to think that they were, you know, th they became mountainous mm. and yes. you didn't want to tackle them. But yes. in my later years of, of working, I knew that if I got into them straight away, set that time aside, to have a clear run at them. Mm. They were never as bad as mm. as, um, um, as in my mind mm. I imagined they could have been. And yes. I learned to deal with a lot more things more efficiently mm. through f mm. tackling them head on. Mm. I mm. also worked with people I needed to refer things to from time to time and found that they were this in the same situation mm. and they would just put them off and they became mm. so frustrating. Mm. People's you know, stress loads became a lot bigger because people wouldn't tackle stuff head on. Mm. Um, so, lots of lessons learned. Absolutely. There's mm. so much in that, Gwen, exactly, when, especially when you said, and the stress load, you know, people can get unwell um, because they haven't approached something. There's that wonderful, um, isn't it, in the United States, well, not wonderful, but there's uh, uh, the Hatfields and McCoys who are feuding generations after the initial thing happened, which apparently was quite small. But the sickness that can come out of not addressing something, I'm good at procrastinating. I should approach things when they, when they happen. So thank you for that. We'll move on. Nearly there. So thank you, Gary. Next one. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plough and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. But let me first say farewell to those who are at home. And I thought about that and I thought, and say what? I'm trying to imagine the sort of like this, 20 year old who's off to follow Jesus I'm off mum no. I'm going to follow that itinerant preacher builder fella from Galilee you see if you go back and do that you're opening yourself to are you sure you really want to do that you want to follow that fella we've heard about him back in those days there were even people saying he's not one of our kind son he thinks he's God. Don't follow him, it's a cult. So what's being achieved by people then going back to say to those at home that I'm leaving? Because doubts get planted. Doubts get planted in our heads. Last week, I spoke of the fear of being around Jesus. People who don't know him or who are ignorant of him will try very persuasively to turn you away. When I first came into full-time ministry, people couldn't understand why I would throw things away to just go and do what I believed that I was called to do. Saying things like, they're only after your money. Well, they obviously don't understand about a stipend in that case because they're certainly not after the money uh, at all. And people were saying things like, how can you give all your time to something that's based on a myth? Because they're speaking out of ignorance um, and they're speaking um, out of uh, what they don't know. People saying that the Bible is so ancient, how can it be relevant 
today. Last week I said this, and I'd like us to read this out loud. Here we go. You can mock my faith, rubbish my church. You can even deny the truth of the Bible and ignore the Lord whom I love. You can do all these things, but you can't deny what's happened to me. That's our testimony. That's our witness. Saints don't ever, I'd love to be able to stress that strongly, don't ever excuse what you do or what you believe. Don't go back to those who don't, can't, or won't understand. I have family and friends who are like that, and I'm sure that you do as well. Jesus reminds us in Matthew 7, 6, don't cast your pearls before pigs, as they will just trample them underfoot. We don't need to go back and offer explanations to people who won't appreciate them. Have you ever considered that you may not be the best person to witness to that person? Someone else may have a better opportunity to witness to them than you do. And so listen to the Spirit as he leads you. Sadly, statistics say that up to 90% of people in this town, in this country, have no interest whatsoever in the things that I trust are at the core of your very being. 90% of people have no interest in those things. And why is that? Well, there are many reasons why. But here are just a couple that I struggle with and I share them with you this morning. Possibly, people don't engage with the things of faith because they haven't been told. They won't engage with the things of faith because they haven't been told. Yet, in this country, I doubt that as we have Christmas and Easter, that anyone can honestly say that they have not heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We celebrate Christmas and Easter. So there will be at least some knowledge of the things of Christianity. Romans 1.20 reminds us that the existence of God is everywhere in the natural and that on that final day, there will be no excuses of not having knowledge. Here's the first one that I struggled with. The second one is this. Possibly because they're quite comfortable where they are and with the life that they lead. Yet a Christian lifestyle is full and exciting. It's full of hope and security. I hope you know that this morning. I hope you know that for yourselves. I've added here that the death benefits are quite fantastic as well. But that, but they are. The, our life as a Christian is full and exciting and it's full of hope. So why would people be so short-sighted thinking that this earthly life is all that there is? And so then I began to wonder, is it that they haven't witnessed a life so full of joy and compassion and hope as yours? Have they not wit witnessed a life that is guided by, encouraged by, and endorsed by a God who loves us so much that he himself became one of us to show us the way back to himself? That's where I start thinking about my procrastination on sharing the good news of Jesus Christ to those that God brings me to every single day. 
And that's why I was so encouraged by that man that came to see us on Saturday, because somebody took the trouble 51 years ago to share with him the goodness of God that impacted that man's life. This morning, thank you, Philippa, we practiced testimony. We do it every Sunday morning here. We practice our testimony. Because you, we, we have an example to set. Not an argument to engage in. People can argue their position, but they can't argue against your example of Christian lifestyle. And so, the Jesus that looked beyond the historical and short-sightedness of the humanity of the time and dared to challenge his listeners into seeing people as God sees them and to start thinking of eternal things, not the stuff that holds us in these decaying bodies, that's the same Jesus who is here with us today. There is a passage that I use in my funeral message that says this. Read it together. Death is nothing but an horizon, and a horizon is nothing but the limit of our sight. So death is but the limit of our humanness. And so I encourage people at a funeral in the same way that I do to you this morning, is this, read this together. Lord, lift us up. Help us to see beyond the horizon of our brain-sized reality and see the God-sized reality of our future in you. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for the example that you have set. That, Lord, you broke through the barriers of the culture of the day and you sought out the people who needed to hear from you. Father, we thank you that Jesus was not constrained, but actually he went and poured out the salvation that comes through him to all who are willing to listen. Help us, Father, to hear today that you have called us as well to move out of those uh, times of uh, will I, won't I, and recognize the divine appointments you make for us. Help us, Lord, to know you, to walk with you, to be encouraged by you and to grow in you and that through us, by your grace and by your spirit, our lives will be an encouragement, will be a light in this dark world and that we, with you, can walk into the enemy's camp and take back what belongs to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Philippa. Please stand and join us. We're going to sing Jesus Messiah as we prepare for communion.
Jesus, Messiah. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you came to us and met us at our point of need. Thank you that you have given us this opportunity to remember the sacrifice that you made for each and one of us. Thank you, Lord. Please be seated. On the night before Jesus died, he gathered his friends together around a table, exactly as we are here this morning. And he took the most humble element on the table, simple loaf of bread. We do it with wafers, but he took a simple loaf of bread and he gave it eternal significance when he said, this is my body given for you. He said, take and eat all of you and do this to remember me. And then after supper, he took a cup of wine and after he had given you thanks, he said to them, this is my blood of the new covenant, the new promise. The invitation back into the very throne room of God through the sacrifice that I make for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. He said, take this 
and drink it, all of you, and do this to remember me. And so, merciful God, we thank you that you send in kindness your Holy Spirit to settle on this bread and this wine and that you fill them with the fullness of Jesus. Father, let that same Spirit rest on each of us. converting us from the patterns of this passing world until we conform to the shape of him whose food we now share. For he whom the universe could not contain now meets us in this bread and he who redeems us calls us by name now meets us in this cup. So friends, take this bread and this wine for in them, God comes to us so that we may come to God. Amen. God's invited you here this morning to meet with him. So please come, all, please come. And we'll start over here. Please come, receive from him this morning.
me and please Gary. We all say together, Father of all. We give thanks to Christ, that when we were still thorough, you hid us in the Son, and brought us home. Thanks be to God, our Father, us grace. I'll go first. Um, Messy Church is back on Tuesday, so it's been a bit of a stop-start year with COVID, but we're back here at five o'clock on Tuesday night. Um, if you've never come along, please do come along and just see what we do and what we get up to. If you're able to help, gosh, we'd love help. And if you're not able to come or help, please pray for us as we um, open this building up to the families in Motuwaga to come um, we really appreciate your prayers that um, everyone who comes will really get a fresh touch from the Lord on Tuesday. I have just had the most amazing two and a half days of exhibition that was here. Thank you to those of you who came. I'm sure you were blessed by the vast nine of us were exhibiting paintings and it was Superb. We had about 330 people come through over the two and a half days it was going. Um, raised about six and a half thousand dollars for the artists and thereby the church. The 20% commission of that's coming to the church, so that's pretty awesome. And uh, a mixed group, like it's a group that I've been a part of now since uh, December last year and really lovely people um, and we all celebrated with a drink here last night as we packed everything down and uh, are keen to do it again so thank you for your support and your prayers and the next one that's on I'll let you know in plenty of time and you can uh, come along again so thank you. Um, Daryl, um, bike ride this afternoon at 2pm down by my place we'll meet at the Hardy Kids car park bring a bike and we'll meet at Toad Hall afterwards. So I hope you can come and enjoy. If you can't make it, pray for us. If you can, it'll be fun, more the merrier. Courtney Street East, um, where up the garden path used to be, it's now called Hardy Kids. And we're gonna do the estuary loop. And sort of like, um, yeah, 2 p.m. And it doesn't matter how fit you are on a bicycle. And we can all meet either back at the car park or Toad Hall afterwards. If you're not quite sure where Toad Hall is afterwards, I'll tell you where to go. Okay, we're going to draw our service with a close. Um, with a really oldie, but I felt it was a really nice declaration that we should be saying out loud every now and then I have decided to follow Jesus and um, the offertory will be taken around at this point as well thanks Sandy okay you stand and join us I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus No turning back, no turning back The world behind me, the cross before Turn the night.
God, we thank you that out of the abundance you give us, we can joyfully give back to you. So take this, our humble offering. Multiply it by your spirit for the glory of your name and the coming of your kingdom in this place and beyond, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, if you haven't had chocolates, there's some on the tables, there's mm. some at the back. Mm. Please make sure you take them. They're there today because it's been volunteer week and everyone that's part of a church is a volunteer and everyone does stuff so that's just your little treat take today as you go can i take some for the grandkids yes you can thank you <laughs> well they're coming on wednesday so please pray for us <laughs> <laughs> two six-year-old twins uh, and they've discovered tag teaming there we go thanks gary Let's say together, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So be of good courage, hold fast to that which is good, render to no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honour everyone, love and serve the Lord, and go from here this day rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So go now, go in peace. Thank you, saints. Bless you. Thank you so much. Thank you.